Hello everyone, my name is Robius, and today I'm proud to introduce you all to the first episode in the revival series of Assassin's Creed The Real History. As I've mentioned in the past, this video will be representative of the new format I'll be using for this updated content. For that reason, I look forward to hearing your feedback on the new look of Assassin's Creed The Real History, the series where we explore the actual history behind the fiction-injected depictions of various components in the Assassin's Creed franchise while comparing the game's interpretation to the historical source material. As is customary, please be wary of story spoilers ahead. Without further delay, let's dive into our first episode, in which we'll be exploring the history of the London-based serial killer who took center stage in his own Assassin's Creed Syndicate DLC, Jack the Ripper. Please keep in mind, the format for this one will be a bit odd, since the identity of the discussed individual was never discovered, and the record of his existence is rather brief and mainly based around the evidence gathered at his crime scenes. Having said that, let's begin by discussing the Ripper's brief history prior to his introduction in the game. Despite historians often debating on the exact amount of victims attributed to the Ripper, the majority agree that he was responsible for at least five distinct murders. Within this context, it can be said that the first official record of the Whitechapel murderer, as he was originally known, came about in the early hours of August 31st, 1888. The initial victim was Mary Ann Nichols, a prostitute who had been speaking with her friend Emily Holland, also known as Nellie as she was depicted in Assassin's Creed Syndicate, not just an hour before being killed. Her body was discovered by some passing individuals who quickly alerted police to the scene, where Nichols had had her throat slit twice and received additional wounds to her abdomen. The media originally associated the murders with a series of killings in the Whitechapel district that had been attributed to gang violence over the past few months. However, due to the public suggestions that this may be the work of a serial killer, Scotland Yard opened further investigations into the crimes and assigned more inspectors to the case. Among this group was Detective Inspector Frederick Aberline, an individual very familiar with the district and an ally of the Fry Twins in Assassin's Creed Syndicate's main story. The police inquest concluded that Nichols' murder was likely not connected to the previous killings in Whitechapel due to the change of method and weapon used. However, just as this investigation neared its closing, another murder occurred. On the morning of September 8, 1888, Annie Chapman's body was discovered by local residents. Most of her belongings were accounted for except for her brass rings, which appeared to be missing. Although it is thought she may have pawned them off earlier, this anecdote likely inspired a later twist in Assassin's Creed's interpretation of the history, which will be discussed further in the video. Nevertheless, Scotland Yard began to make links between the murders, as Chapman suffered similar wounds to her throat and abdominal area by means of a blade of comparable size and design. Despite being killed near a building housing 16 people, nobody saw or heard anything. An autopsy later concluded that the killer may have choked her before slicing her throat, disemboweling her, and then removing her uterus. Unwilling to share significant details of the case with the media, the police left the latter to scramble and develop their own theories. This led newspapers to conduct their own investigations, which had them come across the name Leather Apron, which denizens of Whitechapel used when discussing the killer. Unfortunately, this moniker was actually associated to an immigrant shoemaker named John Pizer, who was soon blamed for the murders. He was, however, eventually successful in proving his innocence. As the case gained traction with the public, newspaper organizations and the police started receiving a huge influx of letters. Many were from individuals hoping to help catch the killer, but a certain percent purported to be from the killer himself. Although the vast majority of these were clearly false, a few were considered as possibly being sent by the actual murderer at the time. The first among these letters to gain attention was referred to as the Dear Boss Letter. In it, the apparent killer goaded on the police about his work, mentioning he would cut his next victim's ear off and send it to their office. Within the same letter, the author dismissed the leather apron name and instead signed with the title of Jack the Ripper, a name which was later quickly adopted by the media when discussing the elusive serial killer. The reason this letter was considered more serious than others was because of the events that followed soon after. At this point, we can move on to the next chapter in the video as we've reached the time frame in which the Assassin's Creed Syndicate DLC began. In the game, the fictional character Jacob Fry had returned to London with the hopes of putting an end to the Whitechapel murders. Jacob, in the early hours of September 30th, 1888, is seen discussing with a journalist about why it is important to not publish the aforementioned letters, since they are turning a run-of-the-mill murderer into a legend. Historically, this was just three days after the Dear Boss letter was received, at which point two more women, Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes, were found murdered. In the game, Jacob is alerted to these killings by his ally Nelly, who, as I mentioned earlier, was historically recorded as having been speaking to the previous victim just before her death. 
Nellie then brings Jacob to the scene of the double murder, when, in actuality, both women were killed at different locations after a certain interval of time had passed. In fact, the first killing occurred in the Whitechapel district, while the second technically fell under the jurisdiction of the City of London, which was the catalyst for involving the lawmen of that area to join the investigation. Although police were initially skeptical that Stride was also a Ripper victim, since her abdomen wasn't mutilated, it was noted she was killed by a similar wound to the neck. Later investigations pointed to the fact that Stride's body may have been found immediately after her murder, leading to the theory that perhaps the Ripper was interrupted before being able to complete his signature atrocities. Meanwhile, Eddowes, whose body was found nearly an hour later, had her throat slit, her abdomen mutilated, and was missing her left kidney and most of her uterus. In addition, it was found that Eddowes was missing part of her ear, which matched the threat proposed in the Dear Boss letter. Although this gave strength to the idea that the letter was sent by the killer, later analysis led to the conclusion that part of her ear may have been unintentionally cut off during the brutal attack. This became more compelling since the ear was never sent to the police as had been originally threatened. At this point, in the game, after evaluating the crime scene, Jacob sent Nellie away to hide. He then discovered a secret message left behind by the Ripper for him, and subsequently began to hunt down the killer. Jack, however, eventually caught up with Jacob and captured him. Historically speaking, another prominent communication, referred to as the Saucy Jack postcard, was received a day after the murder of Stride and Eddowes. With handwriting similar to that in the Dear Boss letter, it referred to the killings as a double event, and made reference to the murderer being interrupted during the first kill and not having time to gather the ears as promised. In a desperate attempt to gain more information, the police allowed these letters to be published in newspapers to see if somebody could recognize the handwriting. In retrospect, although these letters were more believable than most, it has since been agreed that the majority of the information about these killings was public knowledge by the time the letters were sent. Certain sources claim that a journalist eventually admitted to authoring both letters to boost newspaper sales, although this theory is not wholly accepted by all historians. A few weeks after the double murder, George Lusk, the head of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, received a letter referred to as the From Hell Letter alongside a preserved portion of a human kidney. This letter, written in a very different style, had the author claiming to have eaten part of the kidney, which was implied as being the one taken from Eddowes at the scene of her murder. The letter was not signed Jack the Ripper, and the police were incapable of proving the kidney belonged to Eddowes. The entire month of October went by without a single murder, which may be attributed to the increased police presence on the streets. However, on October 29, 1888, another letter was received by Thomas Openshaw, the surgeon who had evaluated the aforementioned kidney that had been sent to Lusk earlier that month. This letter, signed Jack the Ripper, implied that he would soon be sending more organs to the hospital. Within Assassin's Creed's interpretation of the history, at this point, one month after Jacob's disappearance, his twin sister Evie arrives in London. She too is presented as a friend of the real-life detective Aberline, who informs her that her brother is missing and that the police have very little information on the Ripper. Evie therefore begins her own investigation into the Ripper murders. This fictional portion of the game continues up until the morning of November 9th, 1888, when the DLC comes back in touch with the actual history. On this day, the body of a fifth prostitute, Mary Jane Kelly, was discovered. The scene was investigated by a team sent from Scotland Yard, which included Frederick Aberline. It was estimated that since this murder was committed in a private room, the killer may have taken up to two hours performing his atrocious deeds, which included slitting the victim's throat, disemboweling the body, emptying it of most of its organs, and eventually stealing her heart. Mary Jane Kelly is considered to be the last of the Ripper's victims by most historians. In the game, Detective Aberline allows Evie to investigate the scene for any clues they may have missed. Historically speaking, this is the last recorded event generally attributed to the serial killer known as Jack the Ripper. Beyond this point, he simply disappeared from history. Following Kelly's death, there were approximately nine murders that occurred over the next two years which were at some point attributed to the Ripper, but eventually discredited by the majority of sources as being unassociated with that serial killer. His pattern of killing at night during or close to a weekend, either at the start or end of the month with the same increasing degree of brutality and pension for mutilation was never repeated in that area. A massive investigation took place as a joint effort between Scotland Yard and the City of London Police during and after the four months in which the Ripper is thought to have operated, also dubbed the Autumn of Terror. Despite thousands of individuals being interviewed, hundreds investigated, and dozens detained, there was never enough evidence to successfully blame a single suspect. Although there is significant disagreement as to why the murder suddenly stopped, the main theories maintain that the killer either died, 
was imprisoned or institutionalized, or perhaps just emigrated from the area. For this final chapter of the video, we'll review what we learned so far and consider the differences between Assassin's Creed Syndicate's portrayal of Jack the Ripper and his relatively confirmed history. To begin, we can go through the main points where the game differed from history. Let's get the obvious stuff out of the way immediately. Jack the Ripper was clearly not a rogue member of a secret order of assassins, and his victims, the five aforementioned prostitutes, weren't also members of that same order that were actually sent to kill him. In addition, although there were other speculated victims of the serial killer, he did not kill abundantly as he did in the game, nor is there any evidence of him kidnapping people to use as leverage in manipulating the newspapers to build an atmosphere of terror in London. Lastly, there is clearly no official record of the murderer known as Jack the Ripper being killed. Now, having said all that, let's discuss the major points the game got right and how it tied its fictional story into the actual history. First, although I would have liked the game to maybe point the finger to one of the major figures accused of being the Ripper at some point in history, it's understandable that for the sake of the plot, he was kept as being portrayed as a fictional member of the Assassin's Brotherhood. Furthermore, despite the fact that the concept of his five main victims being assassins in disguise as prostitutes was a bit of a stretch, even for the Assassin's Creed storyline, what I did appreciate was its use of an anecdote I mentioned during the Annie Chapman investigation. Records state that for some time the police thought her rings may have been stolen, but eventually settled on the idea that she likely pawned them off before her death. This was tied into the game's story by having each of the assassins disguised as prostitutes throwing away their rings, which identify them as members of the secret order, before their death to hide the Brotherhood's existence from the public. Next, despite there being no historical record of the Ripper manipulating the newspapers to develop fear in London, in actuality the media did this themselves. One of the main reasons Jack the Ripper has become so infamous was the mass coverage of his crimes and the widespread speculation of newspaper organizations around the world, all seeking to gather any information possible to further develop on the story. Tying into this point, I appreciated the way some of the side missions in the DLC had you hunting down the authors of certain false Ripper letters, with them providing a variety of reasons for contributing to this mayhem. Lastly, as I mentioned, although we can't confirm the Ripper was killed, his murder was considered one of the possible explanations for why his crime wave suddenly stopped. Overall, it's hard to judge whether or not the character was fairly represented in the game due to the significant lack of information surrounding his actual history. What can be said is that the Assassin's Creed Syndicate DLC definitely took some liberties in over-exaggerating the Ripper's presence and actions in London, but it was successful in providing what I consider to be an interesting use of fiction to fill in many of the gaps left by history. In summary, this marriage of history and fiction can be put like this. According to the game, Jack the Ripper was an assassin, gone rogue, who went on a murder spree and was eventually killed by one of his mentors. His death was then covered up by Inspector Detective Frederick Aberline, an ally of the assassins, to maintain the secrecy of the Brotherhood and shield them from becoming enemies of the state due to Jack's actions. It may be a bit over the top, but I personally liked it as a tie-in to the Assassin's Creed mythos. Having said that, this concludes our first episode in this revival series of Assassin's Creed The Real History. I would like to thank you all for watching and ask that if you enjoyed the video, please show your support by sharing it with your friends. If there's any element of the Assassin's Creed series you would like me to cover in a future video, whether it be an individual, an event, or something else altogether, please let me know in the comments below. If you'd like to learn more about this individual, the sources used for making this video can be found in the description bar below. Thank you for watching.